Okay. Okay, we're recording. Okay. So good afternoon. I would like to call the finance committee meeting for November. I excuse me, November. What am I? I've got the looking at the wrong thing at this point. Uh, March twenty first of twenty twenty three to order at three p.m. and uh, pursuant to chapter twenty of the acts of twenty twenty one as amended. This meeting will be uh, conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Uh, I also want to announce um, for everybody that this is being this meeting is being recorded for both audio and video purposes, so um, need to make that announcement. And with that, I'm going to um, recognize each of the um, members of the committee and um, let so that they can respond to let me know that they heard me and we can hear them. So we'll um, go alphabetically by last name and start with Anna. Hi, everybody. I'm present. I'm oh. <laughs> sorry. Lynn, are you, uh, can you unmute? I didn't hear my name, present. I'm sorry. Uh, Bob. Present. Matt. Present. Uh, Bernie. Here. Kathy. Here. And Alicia. Here. Okay, well, so everybody is present. Uh, just do a very quick um, agenda review. And um, the uh, one item that has been removed from the agenda as published was um, counselor compensation, family care, health insurance. Is there a health um, counselor stipend request? At the request of the co-sponsors, um, it uh, was postponed because uh, one of the co-sponsors was unable to be here and we uh, were worried about the time squeeze on today's meeting. And for those reasons, um, agreed to put this off. And um, as I will announce later, but we'll say it right now, just for the public, if they don't stick around for the entire meeting, that um, we were going to put it off to first Tuesday in April. I think that's April 4th. And um, so with that said, the next things are public comment. And then um, we want to get into the um, major discussion of the day, which will probably will be the follow up on last night's council meeting to talk about the appropriation and diet authorization for the um, school project. Um, and then later in the meeting, um, we'll have a brief report for those who are interested in updating uh, any update that Sean has on the 24 budget projections and a report on the uh, ways and means hearing that was held on March 13 um, that Lynn and Anna and I think we're at, and uh, Paul was probably there virtually glued to his uh, computer screen at the time. Anyway, uh, so that's where we are. Is there any member of the public um, who wishes to make comment on any matter that is um, pertinent to the work of the committee, not necessarily on today's agenda? Anything that you think that the Finance Committee um, should know about, if you'd like to be recognized for public comment, uh, please raise your hand. I notice that we have one caller, and uh, so from a telephone, I believe that it is star nine to indicate that you'd like to be recognized. So uh, I'll give it a moment just to see. If there's any request for public comment. So seeing no request for public comment, then um, 
since we're uh, uh, then we're on to uh, the item number three. And I think that we're starting off, Sean, with uh, you are going to present um, information that you put together to respond to questions that were posed last night. And um, so let me turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Andy. Um, so I'm going to share. All right. So the first few slides are just recapping um, where we left off in terms of the modeling. So back in October, um, we brought forward four models um, that we reviewed with the Finance Committee. And there um, were some sort of baseline uh, constant information that was true of all the different models. Um, and then we did some different things, uh, looking at different levels of reserve usage, different, different levels of debt. Um, how much money set aside for capital and things like that to, to look at um, what model might be the most viable. Um, so we looked at four. Um, the baseline model allocated 10% of the tax levy for capital. It used roughly $12 million of reserves, and this is over a period of time. And it set aside three and a half million uh, per year for other capital needs. Um, again, being conscious of you know, that there's uh, a need to continue to invest in roads and other projects on an annual basis. The second model we looked at was one where we use very little reserves. So it tried to um, finance all of the projects uh, using the amount we set aside for capital each year. So when I say finance all the projects, not including the school, all of these assume, uh, assumed a debt exclusion for the school. So these different variables are really relative to the other three projects. Um, so try to finance the library, the fire station and the DPW. Um, without having to use reserves um, in any particular year. The uh, third option was to try use our uh, capital stabilization fund to build it up to a level where we could uh, pay for the fire station outright and not have to borrow for it. And then option four was the same thing, but instead of the fire station, it was the uh, Jones Library project. So those were the four models uh, we looked at in October. And then um, we got into more detail, but this was sort of the summary slide that we looked at. Um, we evaluated each of those models, looking at some criteria. So the first criterion was urgency, and that was based on um, when the last project would be completed. So of the four building projects that we are talking about, when would the last one be completed? And so you can see in model one and model two, uh, it would be in the 2030s, um, meaning that it kind of stretched out the, the timing for completing all four projects. Uh, model three and model four were in the 2020s, the second half of the 2020s. So um, again, this is all planning based on lots of assumptions over, so we're not gonna say this specific year it could be done, but this is the time frame uh, that we'd be talking about. The next criteria was impact on bond rating. So um, whenever we take on more debt, that impacts our bond rating. Uh, when we use our reserves, that impacts, impacts our bond rating. And so uh, we looked at the different models. If it did both, then that would have a greater impact on our bond rating. If it did one or the other, um, it would have you know sort of a, a medium uh, or neutral impact on our bond rating. So uh, that was one criteria. The next was overall cost. So we looked at the cost of those projects um, including financing costs. So if there was, if we borrowed for all three, they would have higher costs because we'd be paying interest uh, for those projects as well. Um, and this is cost to the town. And then other capital funding, um, how much is set aside for other, again, through Joint Capital Planning Committee and our, our capital budget, how much is uh, set aside, usage of reserves, um, and then flexibility. And so by flexibility, you know, we assumed if we use all of our reserves, then that would be low flexibility. Um, if we maintain some level of reserves, that would give us a little bit more flexibility. So the two, the two models at the end where we basically use all of our reserves, that's why those sort of scored low. Um, so that was our discussion. It wasn't meant to say there was one particular plan that was, you know, perfect and would be uh, the, the best going forward, but it did, I think, kind of guide the discussion and that led us to start leaning towards model number three. And then this last, um, this last one from that October presentation, try to just give some uh, context to the trade-offs between using reserves and using debt. 
Um, so when you use a lot of reserves, for example, uh, you're gonna have lower overall costs because you're not financing those projects. Uh, you might be able to complete the projects more quickly. Um, you might have more funding for other capital needs because again, you're pulling from reserves instead of what's set aside for capital each year. But on the con side, you're gonna have less flexibility because you don't have those reserves anymore. Um, going down over here to the debt side, if you use a lot of debt, Again, you're gonna have more flexibility to respond to emergencies because you're maintaining reserves. Um, and again, you can complete projects more quickly because you're, you're, you're borrowing to complete those projects, but you're gonna have higher overall costs because of the interest rates. Um, you're gonna have less funding for other capital needs because the payments on that debt come from our, our capital allocation. Um, and so that might lead to having to have a higher capital allocation. So the ideal world would be to be in this first quadrant, but that's just not realistic. Uh, you know, low reserve use and low debt use. It's just not realistic given the, the challenge we're trying to tackle. Um, so most likely we're going to be either in this upper left quadrant or this lower right-hand quadrant. We don't want to be high debt, high reserve use. That's what we want to stay away from. Uh, that's kind of the worst of both. So that brings us, I think, to um, last night and some of the questions that were asked. Um, and so I wanted to go through some of these a little bit. So this first one uh, was how has the town built its reserves over time? Um, you know, I want to give a lot of credit to uh, current town manager, previous town managers, you know, Sonia obviously, um, and others. It's really been through careful budgeting um, and through strong management of expenditures because that's the, the two sides of the equation that contribute to our reserves are when our revenues come in better than uh, what we budget and when we don't spend our full operating budget on the expense side. Uh, so the chart below gives you a snapshot going back to 2010 of what our budget was that year, how much did we contribute to reserves from the revenue uh, revenue side of the equation, and how much did we contribute to reserves from the expenditure side of the equation. Um, so it varies significantly from year to year. Uh, the two most recent years, 2022 and 2021, uh, were big years, and we think they're a little, uh, we wouldn't count on those years going forward. These two are really driven by the pandemic and, you know, us, uh, the town being conservative and, and projecting impacts from the pandemic on our general fund revenues, um, state aid and, and local revenues. We were very cautious in those two years budgeting. Um, and fortunately, the pandemic, it did impact the town significantly, but it was mostly in the enterprise fund side of our, of our operation. Um, with our water and sewer rates, um, it didn't have the same as significant an impact on our general fund side. Um, and thankfully, that's because state aid was kept level throughout the entire pandemic. Um, so, but if you go back in time, you'll see different levels, um, different levels of contributions to our reserves from each of those years. Uh, so the average, if you include the pandemic years, we put about $2 million per year, $2.1 million per year. Um, into reserves. If you don't include the, those two pandemic years, 2022 and 2021, then it's about 1.7 million. Um, so again, somewhere between one and a half, $2 million per year seems reasonable. Um, but again, it's on average and in any particular year, there could be nothing, right? If we had a down year, um, there could be no contribution. John, can you talk about the 2019? Yeah, 2019 also was a little bit of, of an anomaly because that was the year um, that so the town bailed out the health insurance trust fund uh, when we had some struggles with insurance, when we had some high claims, uh, the town put some money into the health insurance trust fund to keep it solvent. And then uh, there was a surcharge uh, issued on our premiums that all the employees pay. Um, and the, uh, the money that was put into the health insurance trust fund was then repaid back to the, to the town. Um, so that 2019 year includes that repayment um, back to the town, which again, that year is a little bit uh, of an anomaly. Any questions on sort of the history of how reserves have been built or what contributes to reserves? Lynn? So are we saying yeah, I mean, are we saying that we started building our reserves in 2010? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just you only went well, back. To I just went back to 2010. So if you add up the sum of all these these reserves, um, it's more than what we actually have in reserves. Because the other thing we do 
as we look at if, if there's any needs um, that have to come out of our reserve. So uh, we've put money towards roads, we've put money towards other capital projects. So if you add all these up, you'd say, well, we should have that much in reserves, but we've spent also from these end of year um, surpluses. Okay. And uh, I'm assuming later you're going to get to how much we have in each of the reserve accounts and so forth. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Kathy. In, in terms of our, um, when we're looking at a budget, so we're looking at the FY24 budget now, the, the revenue surplus is we received more than we'd originally put um, in our, on our revenue line. Has, where, what have been the sources of that? Because I, the actual property tax is uh, pretty predictable. Is that the fluctuation in either new growth or state aid or? Um... Yeah, so it, it varies again from year to year. The, um, if you wanna go back and look, if you look at the fourth quarter report that's on the accounting webpage from okay. different fiscal years, it will explain for that particular year. But um, some areas that have contributed in the past, new growth, as you described, um, if the development comes in again, greater than uh, our estimate. Again, new growth is what we call an elastic revenue, which means it can be great one year and then be very little the next year. It really depends on what's going, out, going on out there in, in, the, um, you know, in terms of development. Uh, other areas that have come in higher, um, you know, recently we saw uh, building permits come in really high, again, tied to development. Um, so when those building permits are, are taken out um, and going through the process, we collect those fees. When you have large developments like we've had in the last few years, you can have really large fees uh, associated that are sort of, they're great and they help contribute to you know, what you see here but they're not necessarily things we can say, we're gonna get that every single year, because again, right. there's only so you much know, you- The reason I'm asking for that is, as I understand that public entities, we need to conservatively budget because we can't- Certain we, accounts, we certainly- we, yes, can't we, be, we can't be wrong during the year. We can't just deficit spend. So, but it looks like there's a jump, a pretty substantial jump up starting in 2019 with the exception of 2020 on revenue being above what we thought. And then the same, it's the flip side is expenditures not being as high as we had predicted. And some of that is, I think, unfilled positions, um, some other pieces. So I just, so what I'm looking for is trying to get you to, is there a normal year or are all years interestingly different from all the other years? Because you're, you're seeing a sudden, as you said, without the pandemic years, you know, we were in the put a million, a million and a half in, um, in the 2% range, which is a margin um, that we're operating on. And suddenly it's much higher. So the other thing I just want to say is during those pandemic years, we were so tight on operating budgets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we really were like, <laughs> we were trying to avoid layoffs. And, having and some things we just didn't do. That's the other thing about those two years. Um, things were closed. Um, and so there were some things we didn't need to spend because they weren't happening, um, you know, because things weren't open. Um, you know, the schools were, were remote. Um, a lot of our services were remote. So on the expense side in those years, that's one of the reasons why that's higher is because um, either we didn't have to necessarily spend the same way we had in prior years, um, or we uh, they were spending related to COVID where we could get um, use FEMA or CARES um, or one of the, the federal grants that was specific to the pandemic. Um, again, so I, what, that's why when we look at 2021 and 2022, again, those were positive in terms of helping us build these reserves, which obviously we need for these projects coming up. Um, but I would obviously not count on that as the norm going forward. Yeah, and Paul already spoke to 2019. All right, Bob, those, that was my question, just trying to look at, you know, they're clearly isn't a norm year here if you include those last four years. Um, it's all yours, Bob, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> You're muted. There you go. Um, sorry about that. Um, 
I just wanted, Sean, if you you kind of alluded to this, but uh, especially 2021 and 2022, we had a lot of federal uh, grants and that did replace some of our lost revenue. If you could give us a rough order of magnitude of when we see 4.8 and 4.6 million surpluses, how much of that would be due to the federal reimbursements? Yeah, so so we couldn't we couldn't supplant with those federal reimbursements, but I would say our expenses changed because of the pandemic. Um, so, like for example, with CARES, um, we had parking enforcement officers who, instead of enforcing parking because nobody came downtown, um, we were able to divert them to be uh, ambassadors, basically COVID ambassadors, and help spread um, health protocols. So when we did things like that. Um, we were allowed to charge things like that to CARES uh, because if you if there was a category where if you diverted a budgeted use to something that was substantially different from what it was originally intended for, they allowed that. Um, so there were some things like that that allowed us um, to produce some of these savings. Um, but a lot of these savings are just on the revenue side. You know, we we anticipated there would be um, state aid cuts in some of those first uh, early years. There were not. We anticipated there would be bigger. Um, a bigger impact on our local receipts. And there was some impact on our local receipts, but not as significant um, as we anticipated. So a lot of that, those two years were revenue side. Um, and on the expense side, I would say it's just a little, because there were things that were closed down and we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to, um, you know, a lot of the extra things that we do during the year when buildings are open, all those things were not happening during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Alicia, you're muted still. Uh, did she drop off? Um, so I'll keep going. Alicia had her hand up when she comes back. We can um, go back to her. Any other questions on reserves? OK. So um, Andy did a great job last night of going through this, but I just wanted to reiterate. So are all reserves the same and, and really- I'm sorry to interrupt. Andy, can we pause for a moment in case Alicia's having a connectivity issue? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put this down in case. Yeah. John, uh, I had a question on uh, the second, uh, uh, the earlier slides where you were talking about the four models. What is the vision for um, using reserves for the library for $20 million worth? Because uh, if we currently have a balance of under 10 in the capital stabilization fund, it's a project that's coming fairly quickly. Uh, what were you envisioning? Yeah, so you have to go back and look at those models. So it wasn't using all of it for the library because, again, we've set our commitment for the library at 15.9. Um, so it was using um, a certain amount for the library and then other reserves for certain years um, to, to cover certain years when the debt got high um, to help with the um, our capital budget. Um, so I can send the link out so you can go back and look at the, the, the charts because that shows better how the reserves are applied each year. But it was just looking at a different way to do it because that project is coming that's up. Enough. That, yeah. that's helpful. Just looking at that one chart, it suddenly I couldn't. Yeah, but you're right. That project is coming up sooner. And that's one of the reasons why that was not as viable because we would have had a ramp up reserves quicker um, for that one to be viable. I'm trying to see if Alicia's made it. Alicia's trying to reconnect. Um, she's having connectivity problems. So just while we're waiting for her to come back in, Sean, I do remember the discussion, um, but one of the things I noted, you know, we, as we're starting to look in the other hat I wear on the Joint Capital Planning Committee, when we're looking forward to DPW starting, starting to appear, we're in deficit world starting in FY 26, 27, and we don't have a line say reserves, you know, draw down on reserves. And, you know, at some point, you know, 
to the extent something feels more real, I think we need to start showing that. And the decision that fire would be all cash as opposed to debt, at least come back and visit it because it's it's hard to be looking at the other capital side and seeing one and a half million dollar deficits and think of we're not touching reserves, you know, like where's that money going to come from? You know, so just trying to trying to, I know that's not the school is the only thing I want to move forward on right now, but trying to give that bigger picture of 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 draw of the draw on are we talking about the distant future or are we talking about, you know, within the next couple of years kind of future? Um, so but Alicia's back, so I don't want to take her time. So uh, call on her. Yeah. Can we please just confirm that she can hear us? So Alicia, can you hear us? And if so, uh, we really just uh, were talking about a few other things and sort of held the conversation waiting for you to come back is the subject was um, the pattern for how we built reserves and you had your hand up when you when we lost you. So if you can, uh, if, you're, if you hear this, then go ahead, jump, jump right in with your question. Yes, can you all hear me? Uh -huh. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, like on average, how much do we use from the reserves any given year on things other than uh, like these capital projects? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so we don't we don't have any planned usage from reserves in any given year. I think we look at what our needs are every fall is sort of the process that we've set up. Um, so the fall is when we certify our free cash and that's when we make um, any adjustments or any um, shifting around of our reserves. And so the uh, one thing we set up a few, um, a, a little over a year ago was the reparations trust fund. Um, so that's one use of these reserves is um, the commitment to transfer into the reparation stabilization fund an amount that equals our cannabis taxes, um, provided that we meet some other criteria as well. Um, but that's been one use. Um, we've done some one, uh, I think two uh, off cycle contributions to roads that were both in the million dollar range. Um, and I think the last thing that we did was the contribution to the um, the fields at the regional school. Um, so again, they're not planned things, but if there's needs that have popped up or, or priorities that have been um, highlighted, then we, we consider them in the fall. When the bridge collapsed, you drew on reserves. Station, yeah, Station Road Bridge, yeah. Alicia, do you have a, um, your hand still up? Do you have another? Yeah, Question. so just to confirm, we don't plan to use reserves for anything other than these building projects on a regular basis. Right, no, we, we try to keep our reserves um, for sort of the economic downturns, um, emergency expenditures, and then with the new, uh, with our two new funds, we have the reparations fund and the capital stabilization fund. So the capital stabilization is the one um, that is planned to be spent. Thank you. And I have one other question. Um, have we revisited this model since we received the updated estimates of the elementary school building project? Because the presentation was from October 2022, which was before we had the actual price of the elementary school building. Uh, yeah, I think we've, yeah, we've been looking at the, um, the, so the plan back then was for a debt exclusion and we've updated the modeling um, or the impacts of the debt exclusion to reflect the higher price. Um, but it hasn't changed our assumption that we would use a debt exclusion for the school. Bernie? Yeah, just an observation that it's really difficult to uh, make planned expenditures from reserves because the source of the reserves are so variable. And if you look at that chart, um, you're going to see that it, it, there's not a lot of consistency there. It goes up and down. It's more like a sine wave than uh, than anything else. We happen to hit two years with uh, uh, some fairly robust federal funding that wasn't was way more than we expected, and we're sort of <laughs> we're sort of paying for some of that now because that triggered some, at least some some of the inflation we're experiencing. So it's just very difficult to do with reserves. And then we always have these things that um, are known in the trade as the black swan events, um, which is, you know, things like the bridge on uh, the bridge on Station Road or uh, a sharp downturn in the economy. 
So I, I would be very careful. You know, my experience with this over uh, four other communities is that it's very, very difficult to do planned expenditures out of reserves. Uh, and it's sometimes difficult for bargaining units to understand. I've been in contract negotiations where people point to the reserves and say, oh, look, we have all this money. But it's it's one time money. It it does. There's no guarantee that it's going to reappear once you've used it. Uh, and it does use if it does impact your bond rating. So this is just my observations on it. Thank you. Um, so I'll get back to this slide. Um, so again, going through what we have for reserves or for types of reserves. Um, and there was a question on this last night. Why do we have 5%? Why do we have 10%? Um, so free cash, our policy is to maintain 5% of the operating budget. Again, this is the source that's really intended for emergency expenditures um, because the, um, the threshold for appropriating from free cash is a majority vote. So it's a little bit lower threshold that can be done quicker. Um, and then we have our general stabilization fund, which our policy is to maintain at 10% of the operating budget. This is more um, for budget support, especially if we anticipate an economic downturn or if we're starting to see an economic downturn and reductions in state aid, um, this would be the source we would look to. Um, and the percentages here, again, are intentional uh, to equal 15% because that's the threshold that helps us achieve the highest score for um, our budgetary flexibility with our bond rating. Um, so we don't really want to go below that 15% because then we're not going to be able to hit that high, that high point for the scoring. Um, and this is one of the when people when the bond rating agencies come and do their analysis, they sit down, they interview, they look at your debt, they look at your long term liabilities, they look at your budgeting, both, um, you know, yearly performance, but then your reserves, um, and you get different scores for all these things, and they all contribute um, to your overall score. And the reserves um, have always been one of the things that have contributed to our positive score. Our low debt has been one of the things that has contributed to our positive score. Um, the debt we knew was temporary because it was we were kind of reducing our debt in anticipation of these building projects. Um, but this is one area where we'd like to maintain the best score possible so that we can uh, try to keep that double A uh, plus rating. And you know, ultimately, our goal is to get a triple A rating at some point. Alicia? Does dropping below 15% change the rating or what is the percentage which by which you drop below it and it changed the double A rating? So it's all up to the credit rating agencies, but the 15% is the threshold for the highest score. Um, so it would be, you know, it's their process and their calculation, which ultimately produces your rating. Um, but we know that this 15% benchmark is how we get the highest score for budgetary flexibility. Is that within a range or it's solely at 15 exactly? Or so is that the top of the range? So it's be? it's sort of like a matrix. So there's um, there's different steps that get you uh, different um, fact uh, uh, points, basically. Um, so 15% is the highest. That helps get you the highest amount of points for that category. Um, if you're less than 15%, I don't remember exactly what the threshold is, but there's some between uh, two percentages that will get you a, a different level. Um, and so on. And if you're below a certain point, it starts to work, um, you know, it starts to be more of a negative against you. Um, so 15 is the highest. Andy? Sorry. Or, Alicia, did you have a follow-up? Sorry, I saw you unmuted. Yes. I'm sorry. Well, I just had one other question that I was like a follow-up to my question earlier. Um, and that was that, have we ever looked at a model that didn't assume a full debt exclusion for the elementary school building project? No, I think our, that's been one of our underlying assumptions, um, really, as long as I can recall that we would um, exclude the debt for the school project, for the school project. And so as long as we have been building the reserves and anticipating a full debt exclusion, to that would increase the tax rate for residents, we have not been searching for avenues to offset that impact. So our goal has been, how do we complete all four projects? Um, and the school, the cost of the school essentially is the same amount as the other three projects combined. Um, so the, the assumption has always been with the school that that one would be debt excluded and the other three would be funded within our capital allocation. 
Thank you. Andy? So uh, uh, just to follow up on Lucy's last point and then get to the other thing I was going to say. Um, this, uh, the, the four building plan, as Sean just described it, really has existed for some period of time. It was uh, um, the plan that was in existence when we were still a town meeting form of government and we're considering the last school building project. And uh, there was a, a debt exclusion that was passed at that time it was because of a uh, town meeting decision not to go forward with the project and authorize the borrowing of the funds. Um, it, uh, you know, it didn't happen, but that was the plan back then. And it has remained fairly uh, stable over this entire period of time. I think the things that have changed uh, because costs have gone up so much is that we've gotten into questions of having to do more spacing of the projects as far as the time and when they, they'd be done and uh, looking carefully at the buildings that we anticipate building. The other thing I was just going to mention is getting back to the general stabilization fund. Uh, in this base gets back to that uh, post-2008 period, which was really 2009-2010. What was happening was that uh, property tax remains fairly stable because it's uh, a set amount. But what was uh, really hurting um, our revenues most significantly was that uh, the state relies more heavily on income tax. And when we went into a serious recession, the income tax revenue fell substantially. And we not only were uh, facing um, cuts in state aid accounts, both um, unrestricted government, or it might have been at that point uh, still referred to by its old name or and uh, chapter 70. But in any event, uh, those were cut not just for the year ahead, but there was even one year where there was rescissions of money that um, happened during the year. So we were sitting there operating in a year where we had built a budget assuming that we would be getting revenue and the state was in such a crisis that they had to go through a rescission process. And um, at that point in time, with having made commitments already, the existence of a stabilization fund was really important. And I would be very um, strongly against um, dipping into that 10% because it's a, uh, you know, we hope it doesn't happen again, but if it were to happen again, we would really need to do it. Bernie was probably off in some other community at that point. So that's my comment. Bernie? Yeah, it just points out some of the instability in, in our revenues because you can't, you can't guarantee that the state aid is going to be there. Um, if things go south and in terms of the Commonwealth's finances, um, the governor has the ability to hold back. And, and we've, um, on more than one occasion, faced either a shortfall or a rescission in, in, uh, in, in state aid. We don't get a guaranteed lump sum all at once. It comes in and drips, uh, quarterly drips. Um, so, you know, we have to, there, there is an amazing amount of uncertainty <laughs> in uh, municipal financing, even though uh, we're dependent on a wealth tax and that wealth being property and either real or personal and personal. Um, it, it, it's still, there's too many other variables there in, in terms of our other, uh, our, our uh, uh, dependency, our 30 plus percent income, our dependency we are, we have on either state aid or, or other forms of revenue. So there's, this could be a pretty drastic swing in how, uh, how our money uh, appears over the course of a year. Lynn? 
Yeah, let me just add to that. I wasn't with the town per se. I was actually on a town committee. And I know at that point, we had to halt any discussion about building a fire station or a DPW. Um, on the other hand, I was running an organization that had enormous amounts of state and federal grants. And we would get notices at six months into the year that our grant was being ended right then and there. And basically that just meant that led to layoffs. That you had no other option but to lay people off. And what I'm hearing people saying is that we were able to weather that period through Amherst government um, because we had some reserves. Um, and otherwise we would not have weathered it. We would have laid people off and not provided the services that residents expect. So the other um, two reserves, now that um, the two newest ones, we have our reparation stabilization fund. And as I said, the policy there is if the town is in good fiscal um, condition or you know a good uh, uh, fiscal standing is looking okay, um, we will contribute an amount equal to the cannabis taxes received in that particular year. Um, so I think we've done this a couple times now um, and again, this would be uh, considered again in the fall. And then the fourth one is the new capital stabilization fund. And essentially the policy for this one is once, you know, once we satisfy the requirements of the first three, we would put any remaining balance into this fund, um, provided there's no other appropriations for specific capital projects. Uh, so what is the town's plan for reserves? So again, based on those, those models that we looked at, um, again, we were leaning towards the fire station option um, because it gives us a clear path forward for the fire station in terms of how to finance it. Um, we're about halfway there as it is in terms of the goal of what we would try to raise. Um, we have a location now that we feel like is a viable location and it helps reduce overall cost of the town because it's just one less borrowing. Um, not only has the cost of construction gone up again, I think we all know interest rates have gone up and that um, in some ways has made an even bigger impact uh, when we were looking at, you know, interest rates in the one to 2% range a year and a half ago. Now we're looking at interest, uh, interest rates in the high three, 4% range. Um, and it seems like things keep st uh, steadily rising. So um, being able to not borrow for one of the projects uh, reduces the cost quite a bit. So what happens if reserves are used to reduce uh, the school debt? So what we were discussing last night. Um, so again, operating under the assumption that we were going to use the capital stabilization fund for the fire station. If we use those reserves, then that would delay the fire station um, unless there's a plan to replenish them you know, in a certain number of years that gets us back on track. Uh, again, as we already talked about, contributions to reserves are unpredictable um, and vary from one year to the next. Uh, we have other commitments that if even if we do have an end of year surplus, we have other policy commitments uh, that we have to meet first. Again, free cash at 5%, general stabilization at 10%, um, and our reparation funding. Um, and those percentages tend to grow a little bit every year. So you know, they're a function of the budget. So as our budget grows a little bit each year, the amount that we have to maintain in those uh, reserve funds also grows a little bit each year as well. And you know, right now, I think we all kind of have uh, have seen some of the you know, economic forecasts going out. Um, sometimes things look more gloomy than others. Sometimes it sounds like it's going to be okay. Um, but I would say generally it's uncertain at this point what the next uh, couple of fiscal years looks like from an economic standpoint. And I will say that you know any allocations that exceed the balance in the capital stabilization fund, you know, we feel will negatively influence the town's bond rating um, and create additional risks like not having those uh, reserves if something were to happen, some sort of economic downturn were to happen, or if there was an emergency expenditure, um, we would be concerned with that. Andy? Yeah, on the top of that page, you might want to add one more, which is that something I mentioned last night, that delaying the building of the fire station would just by the nature of delay increase the cost of building the fire station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, it, it also runs the serious and almost given risk that we're going to have to put more repair money into both the fire station and DPW. Mm -hmm. 
so how much should be allocated? Um, obviously, this is the, the question for the council and the town manager to ultimately decide. Um, we don't recommend, again, allocating any amount that exceeds what we have in the capital stabilization fund. Uh, we do still feel the best path forward is the one that addresses all four buildings um, or has a plan to address all four buildings. And again, the school building project moving forward is critical to the other building projects because if that project, if the school project doesn't move forward, um, the funding available for those other projects is in question. Uh, so, you know, lots to consider here. Um, and again, even other capital needs, if the school project doesn't move forward, that calls into question what we can allocate towards things like roads and sidewalks, um, because we will have to dip into our capital budget that we currently put towards roads and sidewalks. Um, we will have to look to that capital budget to make uh, repairs to the school and to the other three buildings. Um, so it is a, I get why it's a complicated decision. Um, thank you questions. There was one additional slide and this was um, uh, in response to Anna, your question last night. Um, you had asked for um, different property values and what the impact of using reserves to reduce the debt uh, would be for those property values. So how much would it reduce um, the annual impact. So, um, you know what, I'm, I think I'm missing one column that I need to add before this is probably super helpful, but, um, I will do that and repost it. Uh, but for a property that's at 250,000, uh, it would, using $1 million of reserves would reduce the, um, impact by $5, um, for the average single family home that we've already looked at, it's the $9, um, 650,000, it'd be $13 and so on. So we've scaled it up for a few different levels. Um, as you go out, you can see the different impacts. Again, it grows. Um, it doesn't grow exactly by the factor of, of uh, you know, you, it's not five times um, the use of 1 million because there's some rounding that's in this 1 million. Um, so for example, the 250,000, it's $5, say uh, $5 per year, reduction at $1 million of reserve use, it's $23, $23 of savings uh, per year at $5 million of reserve use, and it would be $48 of savings per year at $10 million of reserve use because it's there's a little bit of rounding factored in. And the, the column I have to add is to give you the, um, the annual impact for that property value. Um, We've looked at it for the average single family home. It was the 478, uh, but I have to give it to you for those other values so you can see what it's coming off of. Kathy? Um, if I extrapolate still more, I, I'm gonna make a comment and tell me whether this observation is wrong um, or, or too simplistic. Um, if I took a 10 or $20 million multi unit apartment building, they would get more relief than would the low income, the lower on the lower end of the housing spectrum, the 250 um, is one of the things I'm seeing here. And it's, it's because of the way it interacts with the assessed value. So that's just a general comment on uh, this, because we've been saying $9 for 1 million, but it's $9 only at the average. So it's higher for- Yeah, so in terms of the dollar amount, it's more, but remember the impact for them is also greater. So it's all proportional to the, yep. um, so again, that column that's missing would help, but um, the annual impact for a property value uh, valued at $1 million is going to be greater than that $478 per year that we looked at. Um, right. So, okay. so it's, yeah, it's so relative to the, the increase that they're going to see from the debt exclusion. Yeah, it's like putting, I, I did get that. So then the second question I had is, uh, this came up in a discussion earlier today. Um, we give some exemptions uh, for various categories of people, seniors, disabled, and a few others. Do we have, within what the state allow, law allows us to do, do we have any flexibility in the amount, not necessarily the category, but the amount? Um, you know, I'll have to check with the assessor on that. I, I don't want to give you bad information. So um, let me check with the assessor. I think it's, um, I think it's prescribed what we have available, but I want to double check before I say definitively. 
So you want to know if the amount that can be exempt um, or reduced from the property tax bill, um, if there's latitude to go higher than our current limits. Yes, yeah, that's okay. the way I do it. So within the categories that we know are the allowable categories is, is their ability to go higher and uh, to, that 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 is my question. I think the answer again. I, I think the answer is no, but I will confirm that because um, we already have gone higher than sort of the the we voted. We opted to double the exemption amount um, several years ago. Andy probably remembers it, uh, okay. when that happened, but I don't know if we can go above that amount that we've already voted uh, okay. as a higher threshold. But I will confirm. So it was just it was, and then my other question is. You can also say you'll get back to us is if I am living in an affordable unit in um, Section 8 housing or some of these where we've set up where your income has to be below a threshold relative to poverty. Can the landlord increase my rent or is the rent basically stabilized because it's a share of my income? Mm -hmm. So that's the question on that one. Okay. I just don't know how it interacts. You know, I, I, I knew one young woman and as her income went up, the amount of rent she had to pay went up, but when her income went down, her rent went down, you know, so it was relative to a share of her income. Mm -hmm. So, so are the people in affordable housing units, apartments, whether they're in a whole building of them or in the like up here in the mill district where we've got some deeply affordable units. So that's my question. Okay. Anna? I always feel very smart when Kathy and I have similar questions, I'm not gonna lie. Um, so I think, and when I feel less smart is when I'm about to ask mine, not sure if it's totally exactly what she asked or not. So I think one of the things Kathy was talking about with exemptions, oh shoot, lost my note. <clears throat> All right. So I think one of my questions is about the um, support programs that we have for folks who are struggling to pay their rent. Uh, some of those are through exemptions, but I, I think if we saw increased demand and if we intentionally put in effort into, uh, into communicating what our programs are for rent support and the like, um, and we saw increased usage beyond what we had allocated to those programs, do we have, in your opinion, and I, I mean, I know the answer is yes, but in your opinion, is there a mechanism for um, increased support for those funds so that we could meet potential increased demand? Uh, so that's that's my first question. And the reason for that is when I look at the, oh, sorry, Sean, you can. I, I, well, I just want to clarify. So are you talking about exemptions or, or so you said rent? So we don't have programs specifically um, for renters. Um, we have an ARPA funded program right now for renters. So I, I just want to distinguish. Yeah, um, we do have you. an ARPA funded program uh, for renters that's helped a lot of renters. Um, and we have started discussing extending that program because it's uh, almost, the funds have almost been exhausted and it's, that's yeah. helped a lot of people. Um, so I think we're leaning towards extending that and increasing um, the allocation towards that. But that is a ARPA funded program uh, specifically. Great, um, but there is the potential to continue it beyond uh, Yeah, I, th I think we, uh, I'll have to follow up with the town manager after to get the final green light, but that was uh, what we were thinking. Um, that would be great. I think that especially as we look at, at something like a debt exclusion, having a program that we know will continue for folks impacted by, um, by this, because I, I think what's, thank you. I know I asked for this chart. It is incredibly helpful. And, and yes, I'd love to see the final column as well. Um, once you get it in there, I think what's interesting for me is it's proportionate impact, right? And so we aren't able to skew this to lessen only the amount for folks who are in, um, you know, whose who's assessed property value is, is lower, even though that would be great. Um, however, I think the what's missing, and, and this is not no fault of, of yours, Sean, because this is the unknown, is how landlords would take that uh, increased property um, excuse me, the, the increased amount they have to pay and, and impact the rent of their tenants with it, right? So um, I think that's an unknown for us. We can't predict behavior in that way. Uh, and so I think for me, what I'd like to see is a commitment to continuing programs that would support renters, um, even 
for situations outside of just this, because we can't necessarily control how much or how little landlords will increase rent. Um, and use of reserves isn't necessarily, I, I guess I would want it to see kind of backwards proportionate, right? And so that it would benefit folks on um, lower assessed property, uh, lower assessed properties more, but that's not how the formula works. So uh, I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Yeah. And the one thing I'll say is, um, so the American Rescue Plan acts, they have to be spent by December 31st of 2026. Um, so that's the downside is that there's a, a time limit on um, using those ARPA funds. Um, maybe there's ways to advocate for that time to be extended out farther. Um, it would you know, it would require federal action for that to happen. Um, but under the current rules, uh, the, the last date we could uh, expend these funds would be December 31st of 2026. I remember my follow-up, if that's okay. Uh, sure. if, if that continued, which I'm assuming it would come in under the budget, um, for, for fiscal year 24. And then uh, if we approved it, but if we ran through it quickly, if we saw intense demand, could that be a potential use of reserves or free cash uh, to fund a program like that so that it doesn't run out of, I, I know I'm playing in hypotheticals here. But yeah, no, no, we're allowed to do it because it's ARPA funds. So it's, it's not something we can do from our taxpayer funds or from our um, local funds. It's something that's specifically allowed from ARPA funds. But you're saying that we could continue it or, or recreate it under our own funds, possibly? Um, no, I, I think oh, we've, oh. we've looked at this in the past and it's been deemed that it's not um, an allowable use of government funds um, for these types of programs. Okay. Do you need so, CEEP, CEEP Community Preservation Act funds? Um, you know, it, I don't know about CPA funds, potentially. It, the other source to look at would be possibly CDBG. CDBG um, could, I think CDBG yeah. would be an appropriate level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's given me something to think about. Thank you. Alicia. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I, I understand and I appreciate the amount of, of time that has gone into the funding plan and expectations for all of the capital projects. However, it's still very frustrating for me that in all of that time, there has been no plan um, on how to help residents who will be the most vulnerable to these decisions that we are making here. Um, and so I would like to see the conversation shift like as it has for the last like two comments, but I think we spend a deal of time talking about possibilities um, and I would like to, you know, shift the conversation. I think that was the intention of my ask for taking 10 million from the reserves is to figure out how we can offset the impact. And so if there is a better way to offset the impact, like to the same degree, please let that be known. Um, but from looking at it, in my opinion, this is the best way to offset the impact to taxpayers. And again, that was what I was hoping for feedback from and feedback, feedback in terms of how we can assist our residents and not feedback in terms of this is never going to work because we didn't plan for this. Um, and also it's frustrating to me that we can make a lot of statements saying we are unsure, like we are unsure how much we use from, from the reserves on, on a regular basis, but we can say that we are sure that the fire station would be delayed if we use that money. And I don't think that's something that we actually know for sure. We can expect that because of the model that we have, that we have, but again, we, a lot of the things about the model are unknown or to be determined. And the reason why we're saying we're so cautious about this is because we don't know what's going to happen. So I would prefer if we talk about it as if we don't know what's going to happen and not as if it's for sure going to delay the building of the fire station because um, we haven't looked at certain models, like not a full debt exclusion for the elementary school. And I think that, of course, if we're following the models that we have, that then there will not be enough money or we might need to delay the fire station. But my request at the council meeting last night was, can we come up with a new plan that does both? Um, and so I think making those calls might be inaccurate at this point to make them definitively like that. Um, and then I also just wanted to speak, and sorry, because I have to go after this. So I'm gonna do like a whole blurb here. Um, I also wanted to speak a little bit to housing questions because Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I'm the only renter here on this panel. Um, and I probably am the only person who has had Section 8 before. And so I can actually answer all of those questions for you. Um, and Section 8 works in a really interesting way. It's not really just that you pay a percentage of your rent towards whatever your rent or 
a percentage of your income towards whatever your rent is, there's actually guidelines as to how much money you're allowed to spend based off of how many people live in your household. So for example, I have three children, um, but two of my children are of the same sex. And so they're requ they would be required to share a bedroom under Section 8, and I would be allowed to only pursue a three bedroom apartment and that is it. I am not allowed to pursue anything higher, even if it fits in my, my budget range. Also, they give you a certain amount of money to spend. So for a three bedroom in Amherst, I am only allowed to go up to $1,800. So if rent does increase, you have to move. You cannot say, oh, I'll pay the extra. It's actually against the rules of section eight to pay the extra. So you actually have to move if your rent is increased and you are not allowed to go above 30% of your income off of the market rent price that they are allowing you to pay for a certain amount of bedrooms. And that price changes for every bedroom. So for like a one bedroom, you have 1200. And if you realize what's happening in Amherst with rents going up, this is why a lot of people with section eight can no longer live in Amherst, because it's very difficult to find a three bedroom for 1800. It's very difficult to find a one bedroom for 1200. And so these people cannot even live here. And that's the point I've been trying to making, make this entire time, is that these decisions that we are making are literally pushing low-income people out of this town. Um, and then for people who are not on Section 8 but rent, I think it's kind of silly to say that like we don't know what landlords will do, because I think, I mean, for me, anyhow, um, and the history of what I've seen and what I've experienced, re landlords always increase your rent when they get unexpected fees because you are living in the property, not them. And why would they want to pay for something that you are using? My rent goes up all the time when my landlord incurs extra fees of any kind. And so I would actually expect and plan for this to increase rents and the mortgage payments and the, the tax payments. So I would expect all of these things to increase. And so I would hope that we would plan for these things ahead of time. Um, also, in regards to the rental fund, I do agree with on a suggestion of trying to see if there's a way we can create a fund or an assistance fund or something to help offset the payments. However, there are a lot of restrictions. And this is something I have talked with Paul about on the funds that are available for renters. First of all, the funds that are available through ARPA um, for COVID relief are only available to residents who are already behind on their rent. So you cannot say, I'm not going to make my rent next month. I need more money. You literally have to miss your rent payment, get a notice to quit, have the eviction process start, and then you can get your rent paid. So essentially, we are not helping people maintain landlord-tenant relationships. Um, and so I have a number of issues with these things. And again, I think there should have been substantially more planning going into how we will help renters. But I think part of the problem, again, is representation and that there aren't a lot of renters on the council or on the finance committee or in places where we're making decisions. Because for people to be able to sit up here and say, you know, $45 less, hey, that's enough for me, is a privilege. For some people, that is not enough. For some people, any $5 in addition to what they're paying now will set them off and they cannot do it. $5 over what you pay for Section 8 could cause you to have to move out of that apartment because it is no longer in the guidelines. $2.50 could do the same thing. So I think we need to change, again, the way that we're framing and thinking about this. And I think it's really difficult to be talking about and thinking about this with people who aren't affected by what I'm trying to, to do here. And I think it would benefit us greatly to have more of those people be a part of this conversation, more people who have Section 8 and live in Amherst, more people who are renters and who are low income, because maybe we can ask them, would it be helpful if there was an additional $45 off a year? And I can almost guarantee you that they would all say yes. And so this conversation is a bit frustrating for me. And I would like to simply focus on, you know, if the 10 million isn't going to work, which again, in my opinion, I still think we could do and come up with a plan. And maybe we don't have a plan right now to replenish the reserves, but maybe we come up with a plan to do so because we need to help our residents. Um, and I think that those are things we should be talking about and thinking about. And that, again, the conversation should shift to how are we going to help our residents because we already have a plan for the town. So one thing I'll just say, um, and we've done this in the past, if anybody wants us to model any assumptions um, related to the projects or the timing of the projects or how much we allocate towards the projects, I'm happy to, to do that and to report on, you know, to provide that data. Um, we've done that in the past where we've looked at what if we, you know, do a project in this year, what if we push it out, what if we only spend this much. Um, so we can do all that. Um, I think 
it, this is a big challenge and we've been looking at it for multiple years. Um, and that's how we've gotten to the point that we're at is that there's, uh, especially with the cost going up and interest rates going up, if the goal is still to complete all four building projects, um, there's only so many ways you can do it. Um, but again, if anybody has any assumptions they want us to meet a model, happy to do that. Bernie? Um, going back in time, which I'm doing a lot today, um, when we, when we started these discussions, we started these discussions with how do we manage four overrides? Um, and over time, it's been worked down to how do we manage one override? Um, so there's been a considerable movement in that direction to try to try to minimize the impact on taxpayers, period, uh, because mm -hmm. nobody likes to pay. Nobody likes to pay high taxes. I've never in all my time in either human services or in, in local government has have had anybody come into my office and say, I want to pay more. It doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, I understand uh, full well the, uh, the impact small increases can have on, uh, on families' budgets. I worked for 30 years with folks with all kinds of disabilities who were living on uh, SSA. Um, so yeah, uh, you know we we have uh, we we've managed I think to try and work this down to the point where um, it's the most affordable that we can come up with, and if there are other ways that we need to offset this without jeopardizing the other projects because the other projects are necessary and everyone benefits from those other projects. Um, I like the fact that I've got a you know, a highly trained fire department and EMTs, uh, uh, paramedics that can respond in uh, three, four minutes to the fire down the street. Uh, I want to make sure that that continues. I like the fact that we've got a DPW that knows how to manage things and could do more if they had more resources. And uh, uh, I, I like that. Um, I've got three grandkids in the school system that I'm on a fixed income. Um, I'd like to be able to have them benefit from a new school before they age out, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've wasted uh, five years and uh, over $30 million uh, because of some bad decisions that were made. And I'm, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not willing to see more bad decisions be made that will throw those other projects into jeopardy because the prospect of the average single family unit saving what amounts to 23 cents a day. If we uh, lower their their uh, the taxes on this by eighty five dollars, um, so let's look at how we can continue to help uh, folks who genuinely need the assistance, and we need to know who these folks are. I've not seen um, and uh, a, a good description of of what the extent of need is, and uh, we need to discover that. We need to move on that. So um, I, I don't know if we'll ever get around to the discussion of how much money do we want to put up. I probably was I present if I were present for that meeting where uh, the decision was made to add five million in reserves. I probably would have argued against that. Um, I certainly don't want to see us making another mistake by turning the school down. Uh, the impact of that is going to be uh, uh, horrible. Uh, but do I want to see us put ten million dollars of reserves in there? No. I want to see us move forward, finally, finally move forward with the fire station. It's been talked about for what, two decades? Um, we have, uh, we're fortunate that OSHA doesn't come in and, and walk through our highway department garage. Um, we need to fix that. Uh, and, and if we, we spend too much, you know, those are going to have impacts too, and people will have to pay for those too. So, um, I, I understand and I, I feel deeply about the, the challenge uh, that we have, but I um, I also heard a lot of talk about how people are going to move out of Amherst because the taxes are too high. Um, I dare say nobody's going to move out of taxes out of Amherst for uh, twenty three cents a day. So that's my that's that's my uh, response to it all, and um, hopefully we will um, before too much longer get around to talking about the question of. What are we going to go back to the council with in terms of recommendation? Paul, you're muted. 
I see you talking. I assume it's Tusk. Hey, yes, thank you. You know, so so we spent a lot of time on developing a plan, and then when the um, interest rates went up and construction costs, you know, went back and came up with a different, you know, multiple options back in October and, and settled on a plan. And I think a lot of our energy went into that. And I think what Alicia is bringing up is really important because we aren't talking about that piece of it in terms of what else can we do as um, and dedicating some uh, brain power to thinking, you know, what can the town do? We're limited because of the anti-aid amendment that uh, prevents us from doing certain things, but um, addressing the affordability issue is something, um, you know, and I'm talking about individual and not looking at global sort of solutions with addition, you know, because I think taking more money, it just, it gets spread out over people who are, who, who can easily afford 23 cents a day or whatever it is, but targeting people to help them stay in their homes. And I, I totally, the frustration of the art, the way the ARPA programs have to be set up that you have to miss a payment is just beyond compare. You know, it's ridiculous, but it's what it is. And, but we, I think, Thinking creatively, we have a few years before this debt starts to hit. Maybe there's some special legislation or something we get through to uh, provide a, a source or CBG, CDBG. I think it's a really legitimate point uh, that we can spend some effort on. And if other people have ideas that we can bring, that we can model, as Sean said, we'd love to look at those. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to. Um... It needs to be a motion, but to basically charge the town manager or ask the town manager to, in fact, look at all of those possibilities and beyond and to discuss this with our state legislators, because it sounds to me like part of this may be state level funding. I mean, we just we now have a supplemental budget before the governor coming to before the governor to continue the school meal program. There's got to be ways in which the state should step up to the plate as well on this. And I think what that what we learned during ARPA is um, during COVID and now and with the ARPA funds is it's really exposed to some of these kinds of very heavy duty issues. I also just have to say at the same time, using more reserves now raises the total project costs of the whole thing. There's no way we can take this, borrow this money now, use this money now, and down the road, not spend more money to try to accomplish what we need to get done. Using re reserves will not lower our costs. In fact, it'll increase them. And as much as there are unknowns, and we all in our lives deal with unknowns, the whole plan is based on minimizing the total cost. And that's how we reduce the impact on everybody. I have other concerns about the use of our reserves. And people have heard too much from me lately about the issue of roads and sidewalks. But this is not, this is a plan that has been out there for a while. Alicia very appropriately has raised an issue that we have only minimally dealt with in ways that we have legally been able to in our town. And we have been assisted more recently by ARPA funds for it. And so I wanna make sure we actually address, are there ways to explore statewide or in our town for how we can help our residents that are more impacted by this than you know we had anticipated in the past. But I do not see the use of reserves as a way to do that. I want to see that done in other ways. So let me ask one question just to, um, is there anybody in don't feel embarrassed if you're the one, if you're the only one, but is there anybody who doesn't know what the anti-aid amendment is that Paul was referring to? Because I'm going to not go into it. If I, Andy, I always think it's useful for everybody here and people in our audience to just quickly review what it says. Paul, do you want to explain it or do you want me to give it a try? 
I do not, and neither. I guess go for it, Andy. I'll do it. Well, we can do, we can also just send out the wording, Andy, if it's helpful. We can send a link to the exact wording. Um, but basically, it's a provision that's in the state constitution that prohibits the use of public funds for essentially um, allocation to private purposes. So we can't it can't do a charitable type of gift to an individual with public funds because of uh, the anti-aid amendment. There's a whole history about why that exists. And uh, actually there are similar provisions in other, in other states. Massachusetts is not the only state, but it had to do with um, state funds being used for originally religious purposes, uh, religious grants, but uh, it, it's more broadly stated than that. And uh, uh, there's a, uh, you know, uh, our uh, KP law is pretty good about advising on where you cross the line on, uh, or can't cross the line, shall we say, on the anti-aid amendment, but it really does limit us in doing things like um, in in Amherst, uh, we had a program for a while where we were um, allocating money every year um, through, I think it was the uh, health department mm -hmm. to uh, give out um, grants to people in emergency situations to help with their individual um uh, circumstances whatever the, the emergency need was and uh, we had to terminate that program because of the anti-aid amendment Lynn? yeah but i want to augment this by saying however with certain monies cdbg cpa we can give money to other nonprofit organizations that in turn help individuals and I just want to reiterate, we do, right? Um, we so do. We, I think we can look at other, maybe more more targeted programs, but I just want to highlight the town does invest heavily in affordable housing, um, both through the Community Preservation Act and ARPA, a million dollars was added. Um, we've invested a lot in sheltering through CPA and also through ARPA. Um, and I think the, you know, the charge we're hearing is, are there other things we can do? But mm -hmm. um, we have invested heavily in um, in those support programs. So, uh, and I think that the other thing, um, Bernie, you were making reference to the fact that you weren't here uh, last meeting when uh, we voted on the five million dollar. I think that there was, uh, and Kathy can speak to this if you want her to, but there was um, there, there was confidence within the committee that that money. Um, could come back because it was uh, because of the availability of federal money that was becoming available to help with energy um, programs that we would be funding with that portion and that it would return. And I think it was that confidence level of knowing that the money would come back that uh, made us more comfortable, though it is, uh, you know, it is what it is, like, you know, it depends on how you, you phrase it. And uh, Kathy, if you have anything you want to add or, but I, I think otherwise. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, I, I, I understand. I understand how the, I, I, from looking back at minutes and listening to a subsequent discussion, I understand how the, the committee made its, uh, its decision. And I'm not at this point arguing against it. I think folks did it the way they, you know, use the best information you have to make a decision. And it's, uh, it, you, you know, but, the, the the idea that the five million dollars will be coming back to the reserve fund gets lost in this discussion when we start saying, well, can we spend 10 million or can we spend 15 million or we got 20 million dollars in reserves? Let's dispose of it. Um, I think that's that's where the danger lies um, in in uh, uh, attributing reserves to the project. Uh, and I think we need to spend more time stressing that this money will come back. I think we also need to um, 
make note of the fact that this bond will be callable so that at some point in the future, um, should the finance gods smile upon us, I forget which god is responsible for municipal finance, um, we could you know, call the bond and, and, and uh, uh, borrow the money back again at a lower, borrow the remainder at a lower rate and reduce everybody's costs. So uh, it's not that we, you know, we're, we're unfeeling and just moving forward like a steamroller from this. We're trying to be pretty strategic about how decisions get made. And uh, my concern is I evidence a voice in the other, or actually in the previous meeting, uh, uh, listening to our, our audit and OPEB reports is that we we've, we've been successful because we've been disciplined, and uh, I'm reluctant to see that discipline weakened. Um, it, it, it's tough, but we've been successful because we've been disciplined. So thanks. Okay. Anybody, I, th I think that uh, what Bernie has said was was the understanding that we had and if anybody disagrees they should speak up but otherwise i think that we're in a situation now where we need to make a decision on essentially uh whether we're going to amend our recommendation or whether we're uh, we're comfortable with the recommendation we made with the additional information we've received lynn I want to call attention to the fact that the council has now scheduled an extra meeting on the 27th and wonder if the finance committee uh, wants to wait until after that meeting to um, make its recommendation. Sean, are you... Yeah, I, I mean, along those same lines, I was going to just see if maybe today we just see if there's any additional information um, needed. And and then you know, if there is, we can bring that back at that meeting and then the vote would happen at that meeting. Um, uh, so I was gonna see if there's any additional questions that were not addressed. In addition to the one that Anna and um, Alicia- brought. Yeah, so those are, those are on the list already. Um, what can we do to increase exemptions or is there any flexibility around exemptions? Um, you know, looking at other ways, uh, other ways to support taxpayers um, through CDBG and some other sources um, would be two things we have on our list currently. And and I think making sure we have a full list of the existing exemptions and programs that we do have. We do, um, and just because since we have this forum, um, there is a debt exclusion page that's been set up on the town website. Um, if you go under. Um, if you go under uh, uh, your government, um, there's something called debt exclusion 2023, um, and there's an FAQ there. Uh, and one of the questions is, has the list of those programs and brings you to uh, the assessor's webpage that has uh, more complete information on each each program available. Um, yeah, I just, maybe it would be helpful uh, for the next um, town council meeting to see whether there's anywhere else in the budget we could squeeze out some money. I know, for example, in, in during the pandemic, we reduced our OPED payments by, I don't know, 250,000 or something like that. It's not a lot of money, but it might, it might make a difference. Uh, it might give us a little bit more flexibility in terms of, um, you know, ways to mitigate the impacts on those members of the community who are going to have a hard time. Um, just just a thought. Yeah, I don't know if hitting a dead silence. I guess that uh, the amount of savings and property tax that would come with that amount of money is really not great and the amount of impact it would have on us going forward with our OPEB plan after last week's meeting makes it a challenging question with that particular example whether there's anything else that's of significant enough 
think that we have to remember that in override, we're talking about multi-year, not single year. But the um, appropriation is single year. Take anything you add out of cash. Kathy? Um, I agree with what you just said, but I think it's worth visiting Bob's idea in the context of operating budgets, which are so tight. Um, the I thought the very good news on OPEB is we're actually approaching funding it at a what they said is quite a rapid clip. So I think it's worth it, at least having it on an agenda, not for now, you know, not in the, this context. So this is the discussion because it was brought up with whether we could do anything to yep. uh, lower the amount that needs to be borrowed. Lynn? Two cautions. Don't do anything to hurt our bond rating because that'll just cost us money in the end. And OPEB is one of those items. And um, the other thing is, um, while we sit here and we review the budget, I think we need to also make sure that it's the managers, the town manager's budget to propose. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And it's just a general statement that I think we all have to recognize is that if we have additional things that we would like to see changed in the budget uh, for the coming year, we don't have that authority at this point. Uh, only the manager does. The only thing we could do is uh, make a recommendation. And I'm not sure what we'd recommend. Paul? Yeah, just to note that our, our mission has been from day one, and it's been in the goals, is to get a financing plan to build all four projects and to put that together and present it to the council. And I think, you know, Sean especially has been really creative at adjusting given the blunt realities that we're all facing to still keep them on track. We've had to make some serious compromises in terms of tapping seriously into our capital to get the fire station moving and also to extend out the, the projects over time. And I think that that was something where really it, it pains us to do that, but it's the only way to make this financially feasible. So our focus has been, how do we make it financially feasible? And I'm welcoming the feedback, um, you know, and that's what the charge was from the council. It's like, how do we do these four projects? And what I'm hearing tonight or today is, you know, and let's factor in the impact on the renters and taxpayers and is there a way to mitigate that in some way, shape, or form for the people who are most affected by it? And that's something that we will, that won't happen overnight because there's not a lot of easy solutions. If someone, anybody has any, we're welcoming that, but we'll dig into what's already available and what potentially could happen. So the question, suggestion was made that we at least give consideration to whether we want to have one additional unplanned meeting after the council discussion on uh, at the new meeting on Monday, uh, but prior to the April 3rd vote. And uh, so we would be talking about our usual Tuesday time. And if so, is um, everyone available? Or I could ask it the other way around, is anyone not available? Um, are you talking about the 28th, Andy? Yeah. I'll just point out that the third, I think, was also planned to be a finance committee meeting as well, right? The third was going to be the forum. Um, yes. Okay. I know it's a, it would be a joint committee meeting. The only thing we don't have is the opportunity to talk about what happened in the council discussion uh, in the forum. It was one of those unfortunate things I had raised the point, but uh, we wanted to do the, do this, uh, make this decision prior to uh, 
the debt exclusion vote, we really needed to go ahead and get a vote commitment made by April 3rd and therefore doing a uh, spacing between the April 3rd meeting and the uh, forum and the vote was just not really something we could figure out how to do. Lynn? Yeah, I, I really feel very strongly that we've scheduled the meeting for Monday. We've promised that there will be public comment, which is in essence almost like having a public forum. Uh, we can't call it that. Uh, and so at least I think um, the Finance Committee um, should meet on the 28th, having heard from both the council in this discussion after the presentation like we had today with the additional information, and also the heard from the public. Uh, and then I feel more comfortable with us voting. We agree that it's a single agenda item, nothing to be added. Uh, you know, since a special meeting, is it, does anybody object to going ahead and doing that? Seeing no objection, then I think we'll just treat it as a uh, decision. I don't think we need to vote on it if there's, unless somebody's asking for a vote. Anybody would like to make it a make it a uh, motion um, so that there's a vote on it. They can raise their hand, and if I don't see any hands go up, I'm just going to make the decision that we will go ahead and schedule. Uh, try and keep it brief by making it clear that this is a one agenda item meeting. Okay, that's where we are, and. Um, uh, Sean, you're going to try and investigate with Paul that one issue uh, in particular that we talked about, whether there are any things that could be identified that could help individuals in need uh, yeah. as we, if we uh, go forward with the level of spending. And at this point, there's been... Uh, no suggestion at today's meeting that we do anything to amend our recommendation from the last meeting. Is that a fair summary? Okay, so that's where we are. Um, the other things that we did have on the agenda, um, do you have anything on updating the 24 projections? Do you have anything new, Sean? Or, um, yeah, I mean, I can, sh I don't know if we ever looked at the projection sheet. I did put it in the packet kind of late, but, um, if you want me to go through that, I can. Um, it's in regards to, uh, the email I sent where the guidance was increased to 3% for operating budgets for FY24. And we have scheduled a, a budget coordinating group meeting for Friday, March, March thirty, March thirty first, I think, at two p two p.m. or something like that. Do you want Do you want us to share anything or questions? I mean, we're happy to do whatever's. Um, again, I've got it's in the packet, um, sort of the updated projection sheet. I just um, let's leave it. Let's go through the same question. Is there anybody who requests it? Because we'll we'll spend the time if there's a single person who requests to have it put on the screen so they could look at it and ask questions right now. So if anyone wants to do that, either just speak up or raise their hand. I'm sorry to do it, but could we do it? Could we look at it just for a moment? Uh -huh. Okay, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, so um, so blue is FY24. Um, the primary changes are the state aid section. So we updated the state aid section with the governor's budget. Um, again, as I, I think I gave an update last time that chapter 70, we're really seeing almost, you know, almost a zero increase, which is, um, this is based on $30 per pupil. So very small increase in chapter 70 for education. Um, UGA is at a 2% increase. 
still below what we would um, like to see, uh, given what inflation is out there uh, 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 for expenses. So, but we have put in the governor's budget and um, the one kind of bright spot, I'll say we're not happy with the overall formula, but the one area where there was a uh, sort of funding increase that was significant was the state-owned land where that was increased 10%. Again, still vastly below what we believe is the fair, uh, the fair allocation for Amherst, and we'll continue to work on that with our legislators, but um, that was the one funding uh, area that went up for us significantly. Um, local receipts, we also made a few um, adjustments um uh we increase inter investment income a little bit more looking at the interest rates that we're getting again interest rates are up for our savings accounts and our cds so we've we've updated that a little bit um i can't remember where cannabis was the first time but cannabis i believe we updated because the the recreation tax is uh continuing to decline in terms of uh again what we get from recreational sales from cannabis um the numbers are significantly down um, so we're, we adjusted that figure as well. Um, so that when updating those two things, uh, it allowed us to do a 3% increase for operating budgets. Um, so this has been adjusted. Most everything else has stayed roughly the same. I've updated the capital section a little bit with what we found out at Fort Town Meeting um, in terms of our regional assessment. And we, we looked at our debt schedule again to make sure everything was lined up. But the overall amount allocated to capital is the same. And the Hampshire County pension assessment, we got uh, some updated numbers there. So that's been updated. Um, so we're more or less zero with the 3% increase. And we'll continue to, to update this table. Uh, the one thing I think most people have probably heard is um, so the library has voted their budget. Uh, the library trustees have voted their budget. They voted uh, the 2.2 213,530. 2, 2, 2, um, the elementary schools have voted their budget. They voted a number higher than this, um, which is part of the the BCG meeting on Friday, um, or it's next Friday, right, Paul? Not this Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the regional schools. I do not believe I voted their budget. It might be tonight. Um, I'll have to double check either. Uh, I'll get the exact date. Um, so, so there's a little bit of work to do through the budget coordinating group to make sure we, we have a plan going forward. Um, and that's the update. Don, can you sort of that additional half a percent? Can you say what's the total additional money that comes in and how that gets divided up between the three entities? Yeah. Uh, so gonna make me do the math off the top oh, of sorry. my head. I thought you had that. <laughs> Hold on, I can get this. Bye -bye. I so I think it's about, um, I'll double check my math, make sure afterwards, but it's about $350,000 that it takes to do every half percentage point. Um, so again, with the state aid and um, and the, the Hampshire County number going down, our pension assessment number going down, um, we were able to increase that. Um, and it's applied to each, uh, it's based on the prior year's budget. So it's a proportional increase based on the prior year's budget. So if we were at two and a half percent to start, um, again, it would just be changing that to 3%. And so uh, uh, fit between 50 and 60% or so goes to um, the schools, um between the split between the elementary schools and the regional schools or actually if you're just looking at the operating budget it's a bigger percentage but if you look at the overall budget um somewhere in that range anna yeah so um i think paul knows where i'm trying to go with this when i still haven't quite sorted it out in my head so one of the things that i was i've been trying to wrap my head around is what it might look like for if the council amended the financial guidelines that we had passed to have that that amount where each operating budget went up by three percent to instead have that go fully to one department mm -hmm. for example the schools um, and what the impact of that would be both on the other departments but also on on the um on the schools. so you're saying that it's a 350k difference total right or is that per half percent uh per half percent Okay, so so what is the total? So, for example, if it all went to one place, if it all went to the schools, 
this is just me thinking you're faster at math than I am. Um, if it all went to the schools, what would the potential increase be? For the schools? Yeah. If we um, kept the other operating budgets at two and a half as they originally were asked to be. And the, and the additional state aid went to the, to the schools. Um, to one particular district or spread evenly between? I mean, spread evenly, I'm playing in hypothetical. Okay. But, um, um, spread evenly. So I'll have to double check this math. Um, let me just do hold on one second. Um, so roughly if it was all given to the schools and the town and the library stayed at two and a half percent, um, the schools would be looking at increases in the, uh, 3.3% range, 3.2 to 3.3% range Again, it's a little bit, um, doing it on the fly here. It's not perfect, but it would be north of 3% okay. uh, for each of them. Okay. And again, um, it would be it would be three hundred at uh, the, I think the exact number was about three hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. Is that half percent? So that's how much more it would be um, for the schools. Um, and so, is that something that the budget coordinating group would discuss at all? So yeah, we're going to have to. That's what that's the point of that meeting um, yeah. because of they voted um, a higher share than what was in the projection. Uh, we don't know what the regional schools are going to vote yet. Um, but that is the objective of that conversation, yeah. But ultimately it would be the most the council could do if we wanted to was, to, if we voted to, would be to update the financial guidelines because obviously Paul is the ultimate kind of decider of that percentage allocation. That's um, correct. I think the first thing you would do is update the guidelines if that was uh, and, the, the yeah. direction. There's, again, there's some uh, let, uh, state laws around what, um, how the approval process works between the town manager and the town council and education sure. is one of the one of the areas where the town council has a little bit more um, uh, power, uh, control than than other areas. Yeah, to be to be very specific about it, uh, since it's come up before, um, the process you know the council gives guidelines and. Uh, but the decision is made by the town manager. Town manager doesn't have to follow the guidelines, though we've appreciated the fact that he does pay close attention to them. Uh, in the end, if uh, once he issues a budget for each of the um, segments of the town, which are the municipal departments within the municipal budget and then in the larger blocks for schools and library, uh, and regional schools is kind of a world on itself because it's an entirely different budget process. Uh, the council can approve it, uh, the council can decrease it, but the council can't increase except for schools. And if there's a request from a school committee and it has two thirds vote of the council, then the council can increase it. Um, but uh, like the request that came last year. Yes. Yeah. So that that's basically what the process is. Um, you know, it, it is going to be up to the BCG to talk about it. I think that we recognize several things. One is, is that as Sean just reported, and I didn't know this until he said it, libraries already voted the full amount at 3% as their budget. So it would be asking uh, them then to give less than they've now assumed that they had and have budgeted for and prior to seeing their budget. So that's the library portion. And, you know, Paul and Sean can choose to talk about it or not, but we know that inflation was greater than two and a half percent, which is what the problem is all along uh, that we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, that applies 
very much to all of our municipal departments. Sorry, Sean, you, I thought you had said that the library had voted within the two and a half percent. No, they voted the three percent. They voted the number. three, and then the school yep. went. The schools voted over the three, and that's what. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to be really clear about so when we can go from two and a half to three percent, and we and all all the parties, you know, school library all get three percent. So what what you're saying is like let's take the um, the two and a half to three percent from the town and the library and give that to the school. So the schools already are getting. A majority of the funds, the additional half percent, they're getting a, that would go on top of that. So it's that difference. It's not the three hundred thousand that we're talking about for a half. Of, I understand. You know. OK, thank you. Yeah, and I think that all those emails that we got was still which was stimulated by a Facebook entry by one individual. Uh, but in any event, I think it was just totaling it up. It might have been three forty three or something like that. But because they kept coming up with the same amount, and it was the total. Uh, Lynn? Correct me if I'm wrong. We can vote an increase to the schools, but we can't tell them how to spend it. Right. Okay. And the other piece that I just want to bring into this conversation, and that is we are not, it's not June 30th. We don't have final state budget. And if we change the guidelines, what is that? How does that impact if there are increases in other areas? For example, if our plea to put in more money for roads comes through, are we going to say, oh, no, we're going to give that to the schools because we've changed our guidelines? So I, it's, it's a messy, it creates a messy situation. And that may be on a why you're still struggling with how to the language for it because it the money comes into different pots, and that creates a different conversation each time. Yeah, I know you have your hand up, and then I was going to actually um, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about the ways and means hearing is it all fits together uh, at this point, and then we can uh, get to minutes and be done. Anna? I'll go quick. Yeah, I'm not actually that confused about what I'm what I'm thinking here. I, it's more of just making sure that I'm respecting the BCG uh, process. Um, I think that the, the question, Lynn, your point, I think stands regardless of where the percentage increases go. So I don't I don't actually see that as the most relevant thing in, in this instance, because I think that if we come in facing a, a deficit, we're going to have to answer the questions about roads regardless. And so, I mean, I, I think that that'll be that'll be a challenge if things come in differently than we anticipate. And hopefully that's a non issue. Um, anyway, thanks. Andy, can I quickly follow up? Yeah, I, you know, BCG will be on Friday. I do think if this committee you know, if there's support from this committee to uh, to Anna's request, we would want to know that soon. Um, we're starting to, I mean, we're in the middle of the budget process or maybe nearing the, the latter stages of the budget process in terms of developing the budget. Um, and if the guideline, you know, I wouldn't want the guidelines to change, for example, the last week of April, uh, because uh, we would have everything together and then have to, um, you know, kind of uh, go back to in some ways square one. So I think if there is um, if that is a discussion that this committee is interested in having, we would want to have it sooner rather than later, so that Paul and I can a we can you know explain the needs of the town and um, and our view on it, but also just so we we know what that guide, guidance is. So um, Lynn, I don't know if you want to say anything. Uh, what happened at the Ways and Means hearing, which was a joint meeting of the um, House Senate uh, Ways and Means Committee, and it was on two subjects. That was the one in Amherst. They do different subjects at different locations, and the one at UMass was on education funding and municipal. So it was just the two that um actually are our major discussion points right now and mma uh suggested the numbers that they were going to request and uh, essentially uh blending providing the testimony 
uh, on behalf of the town uh, was supporting the same numbers, but giving the local uh, piece for it. So I don't know, Lynn, do you want to say anything? I think Mike, as Andy said, my goal was to kind of provide some context for when people were talking about schools or uh, municipal money to give some examples within Amherst uh, that um, illustrated the needs. Um, and I still have the testimony on my goal, though I haven't gotten to it, is to get it into a final format of a memo and bring it back to the council. But that time is not allowed. Um, it was reported in the newspaper, was pretty much reported the way it was. Um, and uh, we started out with, I mean, I had input from Paul, Anna, Andy, and I think those were the major inputs going in, uh, and Kathy, I'm sorry. And um, I started out by talking about the fact that we voted in Amherst at almost 85% for fair share and ended by saying, and we won our fair share. Um, but I also spoke specifically to uh, both chapter 70, chapter 90, special ed, et cetera. Um, it was a very long day. There were seven panels. It started at 11 o'clock. Um, the slot for Amherst was in panel five. And um, we went up around 4.30, I think, or 4, 4.45. So they were going to go on. And Joe Hummerford uh, was the um, co-chair for this particular hearing and just did an amazing job, as we all expected her to do. So, And then Anna testified today at the transportation um, Anna, you want to Western Mass Rail Commission hearing. Right. And um, had the opportunity to bring that draft of her um, um, testimony to the council, and they voted it last night. So did you have anything, Anna, you want to say about that? No, it went really well. Um, I said my piece, and the um, chairman of the commission actually asked me to follow up and send it um, to him because he wanted to reference it. And so I think that was great. And then um, a couple of folks came up after to, to thank us for um, a, a thorough, um, not, they don't, they weren't saying it in a condescending way, but a thorough uh, uh, piece of input. So I think that um, I'm grateful to the council for passing it and gosh, it'd be great to get some trains. So we'll see how that works. I think there's one other thing that I'll report quickly on and then uh, try and get to minutes and draw the meeting to a close. Uh, when uh, we were getting close to the hearing, I started doing some calculations and was sharing uh, with Lynn as I was doing so about this uh, the fact that $30 per student was uh, resulting in a half percent increase for the town. And uh, I started uh, looking at it and I started pulling a few other towns. I didn't do much. I pulled our region out and I pulled, um, I, I think, uh, well, Northampton for sure. Northampton also got $30 a student, but it ended up that they got a 10% increase. And so I was trying to figure out why that was and there was and then it came down to actually probably a series of factors that had to do with why that works out that way one is the chapter 70 formula is so complex that was being used prior to the student opportunity act and even since the student opportunity act that um, it uh, weighs various factors so that not all um, communities would get equal dollars per student. And uh, so that there was an, an unequalness there. And, uh, you know, it was obvious that uh, when you do $30 per student, um, 
that uh, the uh, lower you are in your per, in your per student ratio going in, I think the higher your percentage increase is. Um, and uh, then the other factor, and I got this from talking with Sandy Pooler, because uh, he's the town manager now in Arlington. In Arlington is a community that is having phenomenal growth in its student population. So they ended up because their student population is increasing, actually doing, you know, on the higher end. Uh, so it, it's it's one of these real peculiarities that, uh, you know, we ended up being on the low end because of all of this, you know, all of those factors tended to work against us. And uh, it's actually an issue that, I already have talked with the uh, MMA lobbyist about, and because uh, we've had lunch on the day of the hearing, and I was discussing it with her, and may try and bring it uh, up at the um, fiscal policy committee meeting next, uh, which is on Tuesday, to see if uh, we can do. And I'm going to try and get a sense from the fiscal policy committee as to what they think their chances are on uh, getting any significant increases in either of our major categories in a fashion that will be helpful to us. Uh, MMA has already put in uh, you know, its request, which is to increase from $30 per student to $100 per student. And I don't think that for this year that um, MMA can amend its request, but there's something in this formula that still just doesn't strike me as being right, uh, given the investigation I had done uh, prior to the hearing weekend. Um, so is there any other questions that anyone has? So we've scheduled the meeting for next week. I have... Um, looked at four sets of minutes that um, there were the first four that I had available from the dates that were listed in our agenda. Um, April, let's see, the, November 22nd and December 15th, I have no recommended changes um, in the ones that are November 29th. They were very minor changes um, to, that I would recommend. Um, uh, the biggest one on uh, under budget guidelines is there was a statement that was put in by the minute taker for that meeting. Uh, I think it was Bill Kaysen, uh, where he put in that members began by discussing the sections in the draft regarding the Crest Department, including adding a sentence or two regarding how Crest will be addressed and evaluated moving forward, funding Crest from reductions to the Police Department. I look back at our um, my notes, and I don't think we said that. And uh, the third one is the financial relationship between the Crest and the Police Department, which I think is what we were talking about. So I would um, recommend removing that second bullet, and that's the most consequential piece and in any of this. Um, there was a repetition of um, two documents were listed um, in a row that were the same document, and the other one was just an, an extra character that got thrown in, so it's really just Scrivener. So uh, if uh, people are comfortable with doing it, then I think that the motion uh, would be to accept the minutes of November 22 and December 15, 2022 as um, presented and approve the minutes of November 29 and December 20, 2022 as amended. Seconded. So moved. Second, whatever. 
Okay, so this motion has been made and seconded on those four sets of minutes. Um, at this point, I guess we'll just uh, quickly go through a vote and then uh, be ready to adjourn. Um, Anna? I'm going to abstain as I was not there and have not watched the meetings for those uh, days. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support? Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. Uh, I'm yes, and I think Alicia had to leave. She's no longer with the meeting, so she's absent. So that it's three in favor, one absent, one abstention, and three um, resident members, non voting members, in support. So, uh, with that, uh, I guess that uh, I don't have any other business. So, I anticipated if I don't see any requests, and I don't see any hands going up of requests, so um, I will send out uh, get with the theme a notice about a meeting for next Tuesday on with one agenda item, and uh, we'll see you all uh, when we uh, are together, I guess, at the council meeting on Monday, which is co posted as both a finance committee meeting and a council meeting as it was last night. So with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks.